was a, you know, slightly different vibe. <laughs> mm. Um, Speaking of campaign worlds, this is going to be the first DMG with a campaign setting built into it ever of all the DMGs that existed. And said campaign setting is going to be Greyhawk, which is the first official D&D setting ever published. Yeah. Uh, in other words, it's the world that Gary Gygax made up. <laughs> yeah. I'm very interested in in this idea because it's like, because again, Wizards have had a very mixed bag when it comes to campaign settings. They have like the golden seal of approval when it like Eberron rising for the last ward. Like 10 out of 10 fucking great campaign setting books. If you look back in fourth edition, like so many, so many campaign setting books. A lot. And yes. a lot of them probably are Probably too good. many, arguably. Yeah, probably too many. Yeah. Um. So if it's half as good, like and again, Eberron, it's, it's a whole fucking book. But if it's at least half as good and well organized as Ember as the Eberron book is, I'll be happy. Like even if it's just uh-huh, a, uh-huh. a slightly copy paste chapter, if they at least format it the same and they kind of break it down the same, I'll be like el- elated. Y- yeah, I mean, I, we'll we'll see with that particular like the the formatting. Obviously, they're not going to talk about. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. What Perkins said, and I think this is going to be a big point of contention. I think some people are going to get a little annoyed because they use the word complete campaign setting. And then immediately after what Perkins said was he was inspired by the original Greyhawk Gazetteer, which was a pretty small Mm -hmm. book at only 32 pages for the entire setting. And he's like half of that was like war shit. And And some of that was (laughs) wargaming shit. But he felt like this gave him like him personally, when he picked up this book, this Greyhawk as a tear back in the day, Chris yeah. Perkins felt like the sparseness, the st- the information being sparse, but useful made him felt like he could make the setting his own. Yeah. They took that inspiration and said, we're going to do a similar thing. So the campaign setting in the 2024 DMG is built in a similar kind of skeleton style with the intention of the, the the DM building upon it rather than just reading it and using it whole cloth. Yeah. Some people, I think, are a little annoyed by that or going to be annoyed by that because the word complete makes it sound like there's a lot of information in there, but then them saying it's a skeleton of a setting makes it sound like there's not that much information in there. Right. I, To be honest, it's, it's like if it's only going to be a chapter. It is. I, yep. I'm expecting like spark notes and that's fine yes. because like, you know, hey, like Internet, there's 50 fucking years of Greyhawk nonsense out that's there. It. It's very so dumb, easy to find. And you'll be fine. You like look at all the people complaining about, you know, 5e Spelljammer. Look what all they're doing. They're going back into the second edition and buying up all the PDFs and the books and shit. And reading those and taking stuff out and Lord, like learning about that. People are going to do that. People, hell, probably people are going on the DMs Guild now and going to buy that gazetteer that Chris Perkins mentioned. Almost certainly, yes. So, like, if, if you want it, like, this is just a Spark Notes, like, this is going to be like you can take it and run with it. If you want more information, it's out there. You can find it. It's very easy. If you don't need it and you want to homebrew it and change it and make, like, again, this is your Greyhawk now. You can do that too. You know? I, I think I, that's the goal. I think that that's that's fine. Like that, I don't need a full book if they're gonna do like an exam, especially an example campaign. I personally you know? am completely on Team Perkins here because I have played a couple tabletop games that have quite dense settings. Mm-hmm. Uh, one of them yeah. being Blades in the Dark, for example. And oh yeah. Or Cyberpunk. I haven't played Cyberpunk Red, but Cyberpunk Red, another example of a very dense setting. And I find that most of the time people do not come to role playing games with the intention of reading a very dense setting. Most of the time, they're not that interested in it. No. And I think giving a skeleton to which you can build upon is going to be way more effective in getting people interested by leaving those gaps than trying to give people every little possible detail. 
don't think every yeah. little possible detail is actually that useful. And I've been largely okay. I uh, I should clarify so I don't, because it's going to sound like I'm being hypocritical here for a second. Yeah. I don't like and or I should say I don't care for setting books as supplements. I don't really give a shit about like Van Richten's. I wasn't like chomping at the bit or um, uh, freaking what was the Magic the Gathering one that isn't Theros? Oh, Guild Masters. Guild Guide Masters. Ravnica. Yeah, Ravnica. Like I don't I'm not super invested in campaign setting supplements in general. Mm -hmm. But I am okay. I don't. When I do look into them, I prefer the sort of sparse general. Here's the main things. Here's a little bit of like maybe like a timeline or this or that stuff like that. That's what I want, because yeah. I don't come to tabletop games most of the time looking for like any sort of deep, super interest, like crazy, like uh, I just don't want to have to read a Encyclopedia Britannica to run the game. Every once in a while, you will run into a game. And if Isaiah was here, I'm sure he would agree with this. Every once in a while, you'll read a game and you get really into the setting material stuff. So like Isaiah didn't think he was going to use Lancer's default setting, but then he read a bunch of it and he liked it a lot and got really invested. And now he is using Lancer's default setting that will happen from time to time. But I don't think you can bank on that most of the time. So I think it's a much safer bet to go with the skeleton structure personally. Yeah. If it were up, to, if it were me, I have a rather, I don't know. Maybe this is, maybe this would be seen as a little strange. If I were making a role-playing game, I wouldn't have any setting stuff. I would have no setting book. I wouldn't have a setting chapter. I would have the game and there would be little bits, little tidbits of information throughout the game that hints at little bits of setting. And then I would release adventures. And those adventures would be how you got the setting information by playing through mm. stuff. Kind of right. the the almost like a Dark Souls S mentality of you get the lore by like interacting with the stuff. That's what mm, I okay. would do. So like, yeah, it could be cool now that might come across as a little strange because people will be like, what if things conflict or you have gaps and stuff? That stuff's all interesting because again, going back to Dark Souls, the contradictions and the gaps and the mysteries and all that stuff is what people is why people get really invested in the Dark Souls lore stuff because all that there's all that theory room, there's the theory crafting that, yeah. and there's the there's room for you as an individual to be like, well, I think X, Y and Z like you can make your own concept of it. Mm -hmm. so all that to come back around this idea of having the Greyhawk setting within the DMG have space I think is good for that reason and another reason I think it's good is because if you're trying to attract new GMs which they clearly are yeah having a section of a pre-built like you're attracting right you're trying to imagine the GM okay what world am I going to run this game in oh there's a setting in this book okay flips to it Oh, it's only a couple of pages. Oh, I can read that. You know, like yeah. that making that barrier to entry much lower is much more likely to make them be like, OK, I'm intrigued by this because it's not. I don't have to read 300 pages of lore before I can run yeah. the game. Mm -hmm. Especially so. since not only with their, you know, what they're doing with this, they're giving you the whole setting, but they're giving you the main like city as a hub world. Which is also, which is yes, the city, yes, super you're getting a map for of, new DMs. Yeah, you're getting yeah. a map of Greyhawk and a map of the city of Greyhawk, which is like, yeah, that's going to be a big, big deal for sure. I think that city map is going to be like worth its weight in gold for a lot of people. Yeah, because they did such a good job with the Waterdeep Gazetteer and the Baldur's Gate Gazetteer when those books came out. I like, like the, the Greyhawk one's going to be fan fantastic. I mean, yeah, I, I would think so. I don't see, I, I see that part being I see the 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 city and the information on the city being particularly a good bit. Yeah. Uh, but I think some but I do think, like, like I said, tie it all together. There are going to be some people online who are like, oh, Wizards of the Coast being lazy again and making us do the writing for them. People are going to be saying that, I'm sure. Yeah. 
Like I know because I was one of those people saying that, but I was only I was specifically saying it for one book. Which, Everything else which though, book? like I don't. Which one do you think I'm gonna say? Oh, Strixhaven. Yeah. Well, adventures are. Di I I consider adventures to be a little bit different. Right. That's, that's, that's why I only harp on the one adventure. Yeah. Like, you know, if it's like a setting book, like again, like one of the things I keep going back with the Eberron book, it's Spark Notes Eberron. Yes. It's so fucking good it, 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 for getting new people into Eberron. Cause there's so much shit. I've I've been like trying to like do outside research on Eberron and there's motherfucking Keith Keith Baker does not stop. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, actually, I think now this year he literally said he's stopping writing Eberron stuff. Right, so right. I have like 20 fucking years <laughs> of shit to go through <laughs> before I run my Eberron game. Right, right. Um. But that's what you want, especially again with the Great Hawk. If it's one chapter, it's even better. Um, yeah, with the uh, with adventures with the skeleton thing, it could be hit or miss. When it's gonna be like these, like the five adventures, let's say, they're short. But if it's like a whole campaign, like or a whole like you know module, let's say, like there's gotta be a happy medium between Storm King's Thunder. And being so fucking detailed, I like can't, I can't turn look a corner without running into an encounter. And then Strixhaven on the other side that had that is beyond a skeleton, and, and like there's nothing here to work with. Like, there's gotta be some happy middle, just somewhere. <laughs> yeah, well, the thing about an adventure specifically, as opposed to a campaign setting, mm. is that an adventure is is you looking to the designers for a tailored experience whereas a campaign setting is advent uh you know designers give me something to work with but i also want to make it my own right it's kind of the difference between like reading a book and playing a story based video game playing both of in both cases you know you want the story but reading a book you're saying all right author just you know take me on the journey playing a story based video game you're like yes take me on the journey but i would like some agency on the journey yeah i look at adventures as more of like a book situation where you're expecting to be taken on the journey and ex expecting to do as little work up front as possible because that's essentially what you're paying for you know what right. i mean so you being yeah, yeah, annoyed yeah. that strixhaven feels weirdly sparse i can understand now were they maybe experimenting and like trying an idea out with Strixhaven? Uh, perhaps whether you personally liked it or not, you know, it may that it may have just been like, what if we did this? So, you know, yeah. but yes, I can understand there. I do think there is a difference between adventure and campaign setting. I think it, that that is a worthy distinction. I don't know that everyone's going to realize that distinction, though. Yeah. Uh. So yeah, I'm. I, <laughs> mark my words, no, if you will. Put money on it. Uh, in the future, when the book comes out, there's going to be a lot of internet discourse whether the Greyhawk campaign setting included in the book is good or bad or worth it or whatever. There's going to be a lot of. Argument. I can't believe they didn't reference this one very specific thing that was right. only mentioned in this right. chapter back they in 1979. They didn't mention <laughs> back in 1975, <laughs> Brimbo Scrimbolo's Ballsack Extraordinaire. How could you leave that out? It is vital. He sucks off the king in the third era. Yeah, there's going to be a lot yeah. of that. <clears throat> uh, speaking of lore stuff. Then they talk about the lore glossary, which is an alphabetical list of famous places and characters uh, intended to be used mostly similar to the rules glossary in the 2024 P uh, player's handbook. That's fine. Uh, I'm into it. Yep, I'm down. Um, they also said it gives you some information from sort of across uh, the years. So mm -hmm. or across the editions, I should say. Um, so they mentioned okay. there's lore. There's an entry on the Raven Queen, who is a big deal in Fori. There's an entry on a Sarerak, who comes from first edition. Obviously, a Sarerak's also been in fifth edition, but you know. Yeah. I wonder if they'll mention the spell plague at all, or like some of the edition changed. Like, I each edition yeah, normally yeah, when yeah. they changed, it was because of a cataclysmic like event. So. Uh, I would think so. I feel like they'll probably reference it a little bit. I'd be surprised. Well, uh, no, I mean, if they're talking about information from across editions, I feel like it's got to come up a little bit. 
Um, yeah, I would think so. Like, the fact that they're mentioning the Raven, like that one surprised me. The Raven Queen, yeah. Yeah, because of how much they de-emphasized her in fifth edition, but it did because of Critical Role, like they kind of not brought her like back into like relevancy, but like they gave her a little bit of a chunk in uh in the Tome of Foes book. Right, right. And they kind of more emphasized her in there, and then like. Again, Hexblade was originally going to be the Raven Queen Warlock. Right, right. And then they changed it to, you know, shadow magic item thing. <laughs> Sword Warlock. Yeah. <laughs> so. Um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, they felt like she was cool enough to include, I guess. Yeah, no, I'm not, I'm not complaining about it. That's pretty cool. And then but again, it is good for new, if it is for newer DMs, like, because again, like uh, I, you know, I mentioned on podcast, like the first time I learned about Morton Cannon was when Tome of Foes came out and then right, I started right. looking up shit and then I'm like, OK, I want to use this guy as an NPC in my game. But rather than me having to look up shit, if it's in the new Dungeon Master's Guide, a new player can be like, ooh, Morton Cannon, I want to use him as an NPC or ooh, Tasha, I want right, to use right. her. You know, I mean, you'll still have to do some looking up because I'm sure it's not going to be super thick entries, but no, no, but it's like, enough just to get the, you going like, like a paragraph. Like, and I'm like, okay, I can, I can work with it. Then we get on to one of the big doozies, one of the big chapters, the big chunk of redoos, the Bastion mm. system. Mm. Uh, so, so we saw the Bastions a little bit uh, in the playtest. Perkins said, yes, we have revisited and tweaked the Bastions since the playtest. Yeah. Uh, I'm hoping they gave them a good chunk of love because while I did like what we were starting with in the playtest, it did feel very start of an idea type stuff. It felt very preliminary. Yeah. Um, I'm not going to lie. Cause I, I kind of read through and I like a lot of like the, the ideas and like some of the things you get and like that players can do. But man, I look at this and I'm like, dang strongholds and followers were way easier, <laughs> <laughs> easier, <laughs> easier easier i'm surprised way easier that. to run way yeah the strongholds and followers rules are way easier to run and because i'm going to be doing an eberron campaign um one of the things that was big in it where it's called salvage rules which was you build a base and you get collect